This time Stark, in this video we are looking at the extent of Dayton up to 1979 and this is things like the salt negotiations, Ostpolitik and the Helsinki Accords. So first of all we will look at the Strategic Limitation Arms Treaty which is salt. So a certain degree of cooperation had been reached through the Moscow Test Ban Treaty of 1963 and the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty of 1968. And if you want to learn more about this then watch my video on cooperation. But whilst the Soviet intervention into Czechoslovakia did stall the proceedings, talks were resumed in 1969 and some sort of agreement was reached in May 1972. So Nixon commenced the talks in November 1969 where they alternated between Vienna and Helsinki and the initial talks were bogged down by mutual suspicion, yet in May 1971 a breakthrough was achieved and this breakthrough meant that the Americans agreed to grant the Soviets a 3-2 to two edge in ICBMs, which is intercontinental ballistic missiles, and the Soviets chose to ignore the missiles that could be launched from Western Europe. Nixon's visit to China in February 1972 exerted further pressure upon the USSR to sign the treaty, which was named SALT-1, and these were extremely successful, and the US Senate voted for the agreement with an overwhelming majority. So now we just need to look at what was involved in SALT-1. As there was some different parts to it, and the first part was the, the Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty. Um, and the Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty limited both the Soviet Union and the US to only constructing two fields of anti-ballistic missiles, each with no more than 100 missiles. And one of these could be set up by the capital, whilst the other could protect intercontinental ballistic missile sites. But the treaty significantly restricted the strategic value of anti-ballistic missiles, and it prevented a significant competition in developing further anti-ballistic missile defence technology. The Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty also recognised the power of the other country's nuclear arsenal, and it strived to curb the race involving offensive nuclear weapons. There was also the Interim Agreement on the Limitation of Strategic Offensive Arms, and this agreement established a freeze on the number of ICBMs and SLBMs, which are submarine launched ballistic missiles, at the existing levels. So this amounted to 1,054 uh, intercontinental ballistic missiles for the USA, compared to 1,618 for the USSR, then there were 656 submarine launched ballistic missiles for the USA and 740 for the USSR and then 450 strategic bombers for the USA compared to 140 for the USSR. But this agreement did make no provision for limitations on newly developing technology such as MIRVs and cruise missile systems. The agreement was also interim and this meant that it was due to expire in 1977. However, there were many positives of the SALT agreement, so the SALT talks were mutually beneficial to Richard Nixon and Leonid Brezhnev because they created greater stability and the prospects of international peace. SALT also opened an era of detente and cooperation rather than confrontation. And this non-confrontational relationship was based upon recognising the nuclear parity between the two superpowers, and this meant that both sides had something to gain from the agreement and a non-confrontational relationship. So the SALT agreements were finalised at the Moscow Summit, and the Moscow Summit took place in May 1972, and it signalled the second time that Nixon had visited the USSR, um, and it was the first when he was president. Now its primary aim was to finalise the SALT agreements, yet it also set out guidelines for the USA-USSR relationship. And the basic principles of relations between the United States and the Union of Soviet Socialist Republic acted as a code of behaviour between the two superpowers. And there were 12 principles in greed, and these included three main ones, which I'll say about now. So the first one was there is no alternative to conducting the mutual relationship than peaceful coexistence. So this meant that the two countries were committed to basing relation upon the principles of sovereignty, equality, non-interference in internal affairs, and mutual advantage. They also said that they will always exercise restraint in their mutual relations and will be prepared to negotiate and settle differences by peaceful means. So this meant that the two countries would avoid military confrontation and prevent the outbreak of a nuclear war. 
There was an acceptance of a special responsibility as well to do everything in their power so that conflicts or situations will not arrive which will serve to increase international tensions and to promote conditions in which all countries will live in peace and security and will not be subject to outside interference in their internal affairs. But the basic principles, and those are three of the main ones, had no legal status which meant that they relied upon trust. And for the USA, the basic principles represented a set of aspirations rather than a solid basis for future detente. But for the USSR, the basic principles were of fundamental importance because they represented nuclear parity between the superpowers, and this, they thought, was the key to detente. But whilst Salt One did produce the first steps to detente, both sides advocated something more wide-ranging and permanent, and this meant that they started negotiations for Salt Two. So first of all, we need to look at the Vladivostok summit of, of November 1974. And after Salt One had been agreed, both countries looked for a binding agreement. And the first real steps towards Salt Two took place at Vladivostok in November 1974. And along with Henry Kissinger, who had been retained as Secretary of State, Gerald Ford visited Brezhnev to discuss further negotiations. And at the Vladivostok summit, an agreement was reached upon a 10-year plan. And in the plan, the Soviets agreed to equal numbers of intercontinental ballistic missiles and submarine launched ballistic missiles. And this was due to the preliminary stage towards a future SALT II treaty. But despite opposition in the US due to the apparent gains made by the, by the USSR, Congress passed resolutions which supported the Vladivostok SALT agreement by February 1975. However, a smooth transition towards SALT II seemed very unlikely, and one problem was because the US argued that the limit on air-to-surface missiles applied only to ballistic missiles, while the Soviet Union argued that it also applied to cruise missiles. So problems such as these meant that the two sides were far away from a finalised agreement that could be ratified through SALT II. So now we need to look at the subsequent developments after Vladivostok, because when Kissinger returned from Vladivostok, he faced significant opposition from the Secretary of Defence, Donald Rumsfeld, the Chairman of the Joint uh, Chief of Staff, General George Brown, and many others. So many new proposals were forced upon Kissinger, and they were approved by Ford. However, Brezhnev rejected these proposals, and the fact that there was a presidential election in 1976 meant that a further SALT agreement would not be achieved that year. In January 1977, Jimmy Carter replaced Gerald Ford as the President of the United States, and the Carter administration began a more ambitious arms reduction program because of both public opinion and his own advisers' wishes. So the details of his new proposal were unveiled to the Soviets on 28th of March 1977, and they included reducing the strategic systems from the 2,400 level agreed at Vladivostok to between 1,800 and 1,900. He also wanted to reduce the number of missile launches from MIRVs from 1,320 to 1,100, he wanted a ban on the development, testing and deployment of new intercontinental ballistic missiles, and a ban on all types of cruise missiles with a range above 2,500 kilometres. But Brezhnev saw the Vladivostok agreement as binding, and this meant that he thought that Carter was acting in an unacceptable manner. So this meant that new proposals were rejected, and Brezhnev started to view the Carter administration as moving away from cooperation and detente. But the Vienna summit did happen in June 1979, and despite the delays in the agreements, both countries wanted the SALT II agreement to proceed, and the agreement was finally announced on the 9th of May 1979 at the Vienna summit. But despite the fragility of Brezhnev, the two leaders demonstrated warmth towards one another, and they recognised their responsibility in controlling the arms race, avoiding nuclear war, and sustaining detente. But the treaty established numerical equality between the two nations in terms of nuclear weapons delivery systems, and it limited the amount of MIRVs. The number of ICBMs and SLBMs were also not to exceed 2,400. However, the treaty did do little to truly stop the arms race, and it was met with unrelenting criticism within the US. This is because it was denounced as a sellout to the Soviets, which would leave America virtually defenseless against a whole range of new weapons which were not mentioned in the agreement. 
But the debate over the SALT II uh, negotiations continued in the US Congress for a month until the Soviet launched their invasion of, of Afghanistan in 1979. And this Soviet attack killed any chance of SALT II being passed, and Carter withdrew the treaty from the Senate in January 1980. So this meant that SALT II remained signed but unratified. So during the 1980s, both nations agreed to respect the agreement until a new arms negotiation could take place. So now we've looked at the US side of detente, we now have to look at Europe and Ostpolitik. So Ostpolitik was a term used to define a new approach to the European East-West relationship, and it was brought about by Willy Brandt's appointment as Chancellor of West Germany in 1969. And Brandt decided that he would abandon the Holstein Doctrine, and this was that the FRG, the Federal Republic of Germany, would withdraw diplomatic contact from any country that established diplomatic relationships with East Germany. And then Brandt's objectives were to recognise East Germany and the territorial changes that had occurred at the end of the Second World War, particularly the oder nice border between East Germany and Poland. But two important steps of establishing Ostpolitik occurred in 1970 with the Treaty of Warsaw in December 1970. And firstly, Brandt's talks with the Soviet Union led to a joint non-aggression pact in August 1970. And then on the 7th of December 1970, West Germany signed a treaty with Poland that recognised the post-war Oder-Neisse border. And these were important steps in securing Ostpolitik and cooperation within Europe. The eventual recognition of the two Germanys was furthered when Walter Ubrecht, who was the last Stalinist, resigned in 1971, and he was replaced by Erich Honecker, who is more willing to improve the relationships between the two countries. And then in December 1972, there was a major breakthrough in the development in European detente when the two Germanys signed an agreement which recognised the other, and this meant that the Holstein Doctrine was dead. So this was the Basic Treaty of 1972, and the Basic Treaty was an attempt to normalise the relationship uh, between the two Germanys, and it was signed on the 21st of December 1972 in East Berlin, and it acknowledged the sovereignty of the two nations and restored diplomatic communications. But the first article stated that the FRG and the GDR shall develop normal, good neighbourly relationships with each other on the basis of equal rights. The second article stated that both countries would be guided by the UN in terms of sovereign equality of all states, respect for their independence, autonomy and territorial integrity, the right to self-determination, the protection of human rights and non-discrimination. And then the third article stated that the FRG and GDR shall settle any disputes between them exclusively by peaceful means and shall refrain from the threat or use of force. But embedded within these articles was the commitment of potential economic relationships, the recognition of the sovereignty of the FRG and the GDR, and territorial inviolability. But a basic treaty did settle the relationship between the FRG and the GDR, and it allowed other European and international nations to forge diplomatic relationships with the GDR, which is East Germany. But by the end of September 1973, both West Germany and East Germany were members of the UN, and this had meant that the groundwork had been laid for the future of European detente. And European detente reached its high point with the convening of a European Security Conference, and a total of 35 states participated, and this included the whole of Europe except for Albania, and the USA and Canada, and each power had a veto at their disposal. And this work of a conference uh, lasted for two years and it reached its for now at a summit level meeting between the 30th of July to the 1st of August 1975. And the outcome was known as the Helsinki Accords and the agreement with the Helsinki Accords were divided into baskets. So the Helsinki final act was split up into baskets. The first basket was titled Security in Europe, and this declared the inviolability of existing European borders, and it enunciated the essential principles that were to govern interstate relations. It consisted of 10 principles that were to be applied to interstate relationships, and these included respect for sovereignty, the rejection of the threat or use of force, recognition of existing frontiers, equal rights and self-determination of peoples, the fulfilment of international obligations, and cooperation among states. 
Now, all signatories also agreed to provide advanced notification of large military exercises and other similar plans. The second basket was titled Cooperation in the Field of Economics, of Science and Technology and of the Environment, and this covered economic, technological, scientific and environmental cooperation. It further addressed trade and industrial cooperation, the promotion of tourism and issues concerning migrant labour. The third basket was about cooperation in humanitarian and other fields, and this emphasised human rights, including freedom of emigration and reunification of families divided by international borders, culture exchanges and freedom of the press. Now, the Soviet leadership went along with Basket 3 as an acceptable, if distasteful, trade-off, so long as they were simultaneous gaining the formal recognition of borders, which was in the first basket, and increased trade flows that they craved in the second basket. So finally, in the fourth basket, it formalised the details for follow-up meetings and implementation processes, and this meant the CSCE, the Conference on Security and Cooperation in Europe, held further meetings in Belgrade in 1977 to 1978, Madrid in 1980 to 1983, and Vienna in from 1986 to 1989. So the Soviets had three main interests in the CSCE, and that was to expand Ostpolitik and develop a wider acceptance of the status quo in Central and Eastern Europe. They wanted to further the process of East-West detente and decrease barriers between states in order to increase trade and economic activity. Now they were less keen on the issue of human rights and they were worried about external influence in Soviet affairs, so there was some reluctance to accept the provision on advance notice of military exercises, and this meant that it was only a wider commitment to detente that led them to accept the conditions in the Helsinki Final Act. Now, the American position towards the Helsinki Accords was slightly different because the Accords were initially unpopular with the West because they were not yet willing to accept the status quo, and this was a result in a formal acceptance in the Soviet annexation of Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania, and it would acknowledge that the Soviets had domination of Eastern Europe and that there was a divided Germany. However, the third basket upon human rights was extremely important to allow some freedom of speech and the fact that there was a relaxation in tensions in Europe was also very much welcomed. So finally we just need to look at the continued arm race because Kissinger was convinced that if a sort to agreement was not agreed on by 1977, and that was when the interim sort one agreement expired, there would be a further expansion in the number of nuclear weapons. And the US Defense Secretary, James Schlesinger, also argued that the US must ensure that they had technical and strategic superiority over the USSR in terms of nuclear weapons. So by the middle of 1978, Carter was faced with the issue that the USSR refused to end the deployment of SS-20 missiles in Europe or reduce its amount of heavy missiles. So this meant that by 1979, Carter had convinced NATO allies to increase their military expenditure by 3% and to deploy 572 Pershing II and cruise missiles across Alliance territory. So the USSR continued to deploy its SS-20 missile system through its Warsaw Pact allies, and this was seen as a fundamental threat to the NATO defence strategy. So obviously there were problems with détente, and there was still a continued arms race. But however, that is the whole of détente. I hope you've enjoyed this video, and see you soon. Bye.